facilitator and different members of the committee will come up to present. So these four verticals are semi-autonomous units within Cambridge. So you can think of them as a collegiate system within Cambridge University. Um, and the reason why they, they have these four verticals instead of splitting up into four different um, student societies is because we, we believe that there is synergy between the four of them and together we are stronger. So um, hopefully none of them succeed from the union one day. The next one is that, sorry. The next aspect is that it's multidisciplinary. So with this amount of, uh, with this range of projects and this range of opportunities, we hope to be able to cover more types of uh, disciplines, not just software, but in all types of sciences as well. So, um, Peter Gill once, once wrote within um, his book Zero to One that um, the word tech has almost been analogous to software. And the reason for this is because um, the technology improvement in software is so much faster than the other aspects of science. And we are here to help to change it as well. We believe that tech should not just be software, but encompasses all types of STEM. And um, one thing that we noticed is that during Fashion Square, everyone thought that in order to join Cambridge, you need to code. This is only partly true for some of the projects. This is not true for all the projects. And it's important to note that our, some of our consultancy projects are less technical, and Cambridge Jumpstart are open to non-tech ideas as well. So we are a general incubator program for students to meet. So this is our identity. The first, Cambridge will always host projects. And we believe that projects have um, provide the most long-term value add to our students. So the moment that we choose, the, the day where we choose to stop hosting projects is the day where we lose our identity. It's when salt loses its saltiness and it will be of no use. We will, always, we will always be scrappy in the hustle. That could be a day whereby we are like um, some entrepreneurial societies in Silicon Valley getting hundreds of thousands of funding per year. But even if this is so, we will never host our demo day in a hotel. We will always do what is required only. So the next one is it also depend on the unity of verticals within Cambridge. So Cambridge big, big scaling. So Cambridge is actually a very new student society. We have started just over two years ago and we have only started running projects since 2018 Nicholas. Sorry there's a bit of an error there. So um, Right now, at 2019 Nicholas, we are running four different types of projects. And over this just over this one year past, we have um, worked with about 70 students who, um, and more than 20 projects in range of software as a service, machine learning, and data science. So if you're interested to be part of this story and to, part, and to scale together with us, um, do apply to join our committee. The application details are in the email sent out to you. Our activities. Demo day. We have it twice a year to present our past projects. So we have, our, we have three major project launch. We have a Megawatt project launch, we have a land project launch, and we have a summer project launch. So the projects that you're seeing right now are the land projects and last summer's projects. Um, the our next demo day in early lands, about 20th of January, um, first week of lands, would be the Megawatt projects, which is the projects that many of you are buying right now and uh, you will be presenting uh, during the next demo day. Classes. So classes are bi-weekly uh, bi sessions for students to um, work on projects together to get help desk more on that later. The next one is workshops. Uh, we don't host too many workshops to answer an events private society. Um, even though we do collaborate with some societies uh, on, and, and um, organizations for workshops. So um, we mainly, we, most of this workshop will be for Hack Jumpstart, which is our um, student run incubator. And of course, projects, projects, projects. And the final point I didn't list down is that we will have an end of term social, which is usually barbecue and free cocktails, um, the running for events. So, our network, um, because of our four different verticals, we have a variety of networks from our current students, our project alumni, <coughs> our startup network, our sponsors, more on that later, our technical consultancy partners. Um, and so on and so forth. We have over 20 companies working together with us um, and many of them are working remotely as well. So we have an international presence. Um, we work with companies in France and Singapore, apart from in the United Kingdom. 
Okay, so we have eight projects presenting today, four different verticals, 19 projects on offer, excluding jumpstart projects, so that is if you want to self-initiate your own projects, um, and X and X number of pizzas. So we ordered enough pizzas for everyone, and if there isn't enough pizza, please approach one of our community members, ask for more. <laughs> okay, so now we go on to the next part. Um, commercial and research projects. Okay. Uh, say about the food requirements. Oh yes, sorry. Uh, if there are any dietary requirements, please find one. Uh, you can he's he's sitting right there. Um so yeah, do that to be a vegan or something, vegetarian or something like that. Uh, for the commercial project. 
Uh, this is a new one code that we are launching this year. So what is it about? So it's called LSC Hack, which is basically a joint venture with London Strategic Consulting. So, um, yeah. So um, the aim is to actually be a student consultancy that has the, the world-class strategic uh, consultants provided by LSC, and at the same time, that is powered by te the technical capability to actually deliver something that is fully functional. And in, the, in addition to that, we also have the capability to carry out like um, intensive data science, so we can actually we will have members with the ability to actually code up something. So now the next question you might wonder is that why should you care? Why should you join us? Right. So that brings me to this night. Um, well, there are three three reasons why you should join us. So number one is to experience 21st century consulting. So. That is slightly different from the traditional consulting because obviously we, are, we take on all the projects with the technical side to it and we will tackle the technical side of the, of the problem in, in, connection, in conjunction with the LSC team. So basically we have a team of business consultants, strategy consultants and technical consultants and we work closely together to ensure that the solution is, is relevant to the business and at the same time technically feasible. So the second point is that, oh wow, by joining us, you'll gain industry experience working on a real problem with a real company with real mentors. So that's something that is not offered by um, many of the, um, by your academic curriculum, for instance. So the third point is that you can develop some technical skills. So as Keith has mentioned, this is probably the vertical that doesn't require um, intensive coding experience beforehand, because you can develop it, um, you can develop it along the way. And in addition to that, you will also meet, uh, you also develop business acumen in the process. So obviously, that's, um, if that's something you are interested in, then you should definitely apply to us. We will start processing our applications tomorrow. It, it has been open for a couple of days. And uh, well, you can apply to it at this link. You can apply it as a technology consultant or a lead technology consultant. So if you can't, if, if it looks too long to you, basically, you can Google LSC Hackbridge and it'll take you to our website and you can click on the link to apply. So the deadline is on the 22nd of October and after that we'll carry out interviews if necessary. And then um, once we get to the induction day, we'll launch the projects officially and then the teams will be formed and we will meet, um, you will meet the people who are offering the projects and you'll also meet the, the teams from LSC. So hopefully, um, hopefully that's something you'll be interested in. Right, so next, can I tell you more about the Jumpstart Vertical? Hi, so um, this year we are also creating a new multiple, which is called Hackbridge Jumpstart, and basically um, it's sort of like an APU salary program. So the aim is essentially take you from zero to half, in that sense. Um, whereby afterwards, then sort of like you know, help you guys exit opportunities or find you guys <coughs> other accelerators. So you can continue developing your school or um, startup. So essentially, what we do is that we try to connect you guys with um, people in the entrepreneurial system, be that in Cambridge or London or um, other places as well, such as Singapore. And um, the main thing is that you will actually need a team or an idea to, to apply. So basically, what we do is that um, we will actually be having um, two sessions. So the first session is for entrepreneurial course. And this basically you just come in as an individual and will help with the team formation process as well as you know, team building and really getting you guys to sort of like um, understand what exactly entrepreneurship as well as a as well. The second session we'll be holding with uh, the Dutch Business School's Entrepreneurship Centre who is actually here today. Um, and um, essentially it will be on the fit. So basically we'll be looking at whether you know um, what solution you come up with, does it fit the problem, as well as whether um, the market that you're targeting is something that you know you that there is potential for. Um, and apart from that, we also offer for actually check-ins. So these will be check-ins with proper mentors. So we have um, partners, for example, with um, VCs like Data Capital, we have partners with Case at London, we have partners with um, other sort of like startups as well as um, you know VCs and so on, which um, will be helping you along your journey. And at the same time, um, the exit opportunities um, are quite a few. So for example, we have partners with the Continue Business School competition. And they've finally given us a green name for one team at least to join them. And the winning prize is for a million uh, single dollars. So um, this is actually quite um, an exciting topic, and I hope that you guys will also consider joining us. So for the um, entrepreneurship first vertical um, workshop, this will be open to all, but afterwards we will be doing applications. And um, so for the um, product market workshop, that one will be, uh, we will actually have to sort of selection process from that. So yeah, and with that, um, I think we will start with the rest of the presentation.
Yeah, just take it. Basically, I think the song that had Chris Quincy worked for Hawkeye, is that right? Or uh, was approached by Paul Hawkins, who's the founder of Hawkeye, who you like to do a good visual performance. And um, he had this interesting idea, which is um, to build a system powered by the sensors and processing power of boats that could automatically control a rowboat. So boats wouldn't necessarily have a property anymore, especially boats, um, smaller boats, two and fours.
give you a map, which you'll come to the making a floating solar power, which is essentially in a way of solar panels and these kind of floating platforms that you can put on the body of water and act as a floating power. You might be wondering why you do this at all. Why would you put solar panels on these kind of floating platforms? Um, the main reason is that it saves a lot of space, because um, obviously the space is a bit of a premium, and it's not like an eyesore for local people. And yeah, these things already exist, so you might wonder why you do it with Heliobank, this company. And the main difference is that this company is building these power plants on the open ocean, as opposed to such as like an artificial lake or you know, like a reservoir. Like most of these going to do. Um, so that means you have even more new space, so you can build a bigger power plant, and you can have more applications, uh, which I'm going to talk about now. So there are a few things this can ask for. Um, one of the main ones is that it can be used in any remote location that just has access to open bodies of water. Um, any microphone to access can run one of these power plants very easily. Um, secondly, it can be used for disaster relief. Um, it can quickly restore power to an area that's you know, other natural disasters that help with rescue efforts. Um, it can be built into a hybrid system with such as like wind turbines. Um, so you can have these power plants in the same area to increase the power per unit area that you're getting out. Um, along with using it to like power the regeneration of unmanned oil lakes. It can be used on dams and lakes like all the compactors. And it'll probably boost the market for um, photovoltaic power producers anyway. So, uh, the unique challenge with this project is that it's all a um, body of water that's moving. Obviously, you've got waves, you've got wind, and that can make it topple over, basically. Um, so that's kind of where my work came in. Um, yeah, that's another issue. Um, if you change the angle to the, to the sun, it can reduce the solar panel efficiency as well. So the point of this work was to test the flow of um, with these kind of situations in mind to make sure that it wasn't going to like top of the world, you put it on the um, ocean and you could spot any potential issues quite early. Um, so the way I did this was to simulate the motion of the way it floats on um, the waves and um, just using kind of a little program that I wrote um, um, to observe the effects of like if you get different wave heights, if you get different wavelengths, what does that do to the stability and the efficiency? And then it can also check for such as fault forces, so if you need the connectors to be, like how much do they need to withstand. So, um, the simulation itself, it runs in real time and it kind of has this like time step method of, okay, it like, sees how fast everything's going and it moves along and captures the forces again. Um, and it can, and you might think, okay, it's kind of slow, it would be nice if you could solve it in one go. Um, but it, the reason, well, the, this can, it can be done this way because it can just be left to run and, and sweep through a big range of amplitudes and wavelengths. So you can see that in the background, go and do other stuff, and then come back and connect all your data. Um, it also has a video with it, which means that you can kind of watch um, the simulation in real time. Um, and that's good because it can you can check if there's anything going wrong with the simulation itself, but also because if there's any trends that you want to kind of understand better, you can look at it and see it happening and be like, oh, this is why it's falling over. Um, and yeah, it can gather data on it, but forces the efficiency of the solar panel and that kind of thing. Um, so the results I got were, at first it was tested with all the solar panels kind of floating to kind of see how they moved just with the waves themselves, um, all the connections between them. And kind of as you'd expect, the higher the amplitude of the wave and the shorter the wavelength, um, so you get kind of steeper waves, and that means it topples and yeah, you get bigger forces and the efficiency is lower because it spends more time pointing and away from the sun. Um, and now the project's still ongoing, so I'm currently working on getting it to simulate the connections between the floaters themselves. Um, and the kind of early tests of this have kind of shown that the forces on each floater increase because it, the other ones kind of drag it around. Um, so that needs to be kind of for with the connectors. Um, so the next steps with this project are first to simulate, uh, once the connectors are done, to simulate walkways uh, between the um, solar panels and also moving lines, how they affect the movement. 
um, also accounting for wind and to gather more specific data. So, see, okay, are the flow is at the edge getting different forces to the flow in the center? Do we need to account for that bit with how we design the connectors, that kind of thing? Uh, and lastly, to look into the effects of wind on such as kind of heat dissipation and that, because heat dissipation makes, well, heat buildup of heat even um, makes solar panels less efficient. So, if, yeah, that's an important thing to take into account when you design a system such as this. Um, so yeah, I think that's everything. Uh, thank you all for listening. And, yeah.
And so in conclusion, we have showed that this proof of concept, that it is, with this proof of concept, it is possible to use IoT sensors in a construction project. And so, but this is just one of many applications that you can use IoT and blockchain technology in. For instance, you can also use it in government, in manufacturing, in healthcare, and logistics. Basically, any project or company that deals with large amounts of data and you want to make sure that that data is trusted and hasn't been tampered with, you can use blockchain technology. Yes, I would add to that, if you think about any operation that you want to trust and you want it to be reliable, then connecting real-time information with trustable way to, to, to access it is the way to go. Thank you. Thank you. Service, you have to get the um, cookies 
from, from now from the browser to, to use it. And uh, you can use beautiful soup to sort of spread the information from the website and then um, use uh, SQL database and then eventually try to get some visualization done with uh, no tool. Uh, yeah. So uh, there's I think there's some, some videos to show you and then uh, you, know, you need permission to do this video. <laughs> Thank you. 
is basically uh, you can go and sub kind of like submit a story of why the company failed. Uh, and the idea is that uh, if you collect many of those, you can have some sort of website where you can display them so people can learn from, I guess, uh, other startups that failed. Um, so, yeah, so we have a part of process. So, much like the previous projects, uh, we're trying to collect some data from different data sources. So, companies have, so, as they explained, kind of the previous one is like government. So, you can manage all the data, all official data on like uh, documents or uh, the amount of funding or the like co founders and CEOs and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we use Crunchbase, uh, which is a website where you can find information on the amount of like, more specific financial data, such as like, the amount funded or like, the rounds of funding, uh, total funding, uh, like, who the investor was, etc. And uh, Open Corporates, uh, which is a paid uh, high level API which you can use to filter um, uh, company, company data based on uh, data of incorporation or data of uh, distribution. Um, as well as by name or by location. Uh, and basically all, all that data just goes through the project screen and kind of like after you place all that, you have this uh, MongoDB uh, database. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, so after you test that, uh, one important aspect is to actually visualize all the data in the collect. Um, so we build the script to do exactly that. So here you can see, for example, the uh, investment for like Category or industry, um, and that's based on about like a thousand or so records. Uh, we have like number of comments per country. You can see the US is <laughs> quite far ahead uh, based on the results. Uh, yeah, number of comments per continent, number of comments per category. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's all very insightful, and it's actually really kind of like. Uh, that's the tip of the iceberg when it comes to company failure because that's just collecting the data, but uh, also the actual work that can go in the future regarding the actual data analysis and kind of like the more um, uh, analysis review on why those companies fail to provide a mass kind of like deep insight rather than just visualizing stuff. Uh, but yeah, that's the progress we made, and um, we think it has a lot of potential for the future. So, thank you very much. Vehicle lab at the 
department here, he actually developed the sensor to do this about 30 years ago. And it wasn't very successful because uh, he got the, like the technology of the sensor, he got uh, perfect, but he, uh, back then, uh, there was a lot of problems with it having a close of cables and other stuff like that, which made it awfully impractical to install. So when they tried to put it on the market, no one would buy it because it was just too annoying. So the way, the way they made it work is that it's uh, a plastic tile that contains a strip capacitor in it. Uh, and uh, when the truck goes over that strip capacitor, uh, it deforms and the capacitor changes and you can you, you just measure that. Uh, and uh, they found, also found that you need about six of these sensors at, at periodic spacings to get an accurate me measurement. Um, so what we're doing to improve that is that we're going to have the uh, sensors completely se separate with no cables, so they will be powered by, uh, by something like a solar panel, communicate to, to get, get wirelessly, probably by Bluetooth. So, so that's our plan. Then they will explain the details. Okay. Um, so we have a preliminary CAD model that was sort of this kind of um, what we want to do when we want to take this sensor. Um, you hear me? <laughs> so we, we have a preliminary CAD model, a basic idea of, of what we want to do with this sensor. Um, the idea is that it, it's going to be a completely self-contained unit that um, people who are building the road can install in the road relatively easily. It's going to communicate wirelessly, it's going to be completely waterproof, and it's going to power itself uh, via a solar panel array on top. Um, <coughs> I don't think there's much more to say about the cab than that. I mean, yeah. the challenges we faced are it, it, it's got to be waterproof and it's got to be manufacturable. Yeah, also, like these sensors themselves are electronically very simple with, and because they just communicate the main station that connects these six sensors together and transmits the results over mobile network and also takes a, takes a picture of the truck so that you can read it. Thousands of words. We've got summaries, about 50 words, give or take 10. 
and titles which are roughly five to ten words, titles or headlines, basically. So now you know in some articles. Summarization. There are two types. One is <coughs> extractive summarization, and one is abstract. So the, the simplest way to think of it is extractive summarization is like when you have a document in front of you and you just highlight, and whatever's highlighted is your summary. So it may not be very grammatically correct and it, it doesn't paraphrase things like you would. would. Extractive summarization, however, is the gold standard. See, what you do is you've got all these sentences and you've got new original sentences. Whereas here, you've got sentences one to four and it takes out sentences two and four. We want abstractive summarization because of some wrong in the complicated thing regarding the GDPR, where when we aggregate news content, you need um, you can't just take headlines from someone else, you need to come up with your own. So we need an abstract summarization. Now what is controllable abstract summarization? So if we have a standard abstract summarizer, you've got these non-controllable summarizers, you could train two models, two machine learning models, where maybe one takes in articles and outputs summaries. The other takes in articles and outputs titles. Of course this is de dependent entirely on the data that we have. So if the data has inputs of thousands of words and outputs of 50 words, then naturally your model is going to learn to do that. So you could split the data sets into two and you know, um, just build two models, but that's not as cool. What's much cooler is this, a controllable abstract <coughs> summarizer, which just FYI, very few people in the industry are actually doing. What you, what you do is you take in an article and you have a desired length, and then it will basically output whatever the length is, which is what we're trying to do. So now you understand my point. <coughs> so what, what do we do? First, we collate the data set because that's extremely important. So um, we've got 4.3 million data points with 1.9 billion <coughs> images. Um, the largest data set out there right now is 1 billion. We use that and we augmented it with our own. Like we, we took a bunch of data from elsewhere. So now we have like 2 billion words, uh, tokens of word. And from over 20 news organizations. Um, then we chose the neural network architecture we're going to be using. So uh, about two years ago, Google released a transformer which has revolutionized natural language processing, um, the, the theme. And we're using um, MSS by Microsoft, which builds on but, which is something that uses the transformer. I can't really explain this because if I were to try, it would be like hours and you probably still wouldn't get it. Because it's really complicated. Um, so, um, the reason why we're using this is, sorry, so when you use MASS, they pre-trained the model and you just got to fine tune it with our own data. But with the pre-trained generalized model, they're actually able to get pretty decent summaries without us even fine tuning. So here's some examples. Uh, this part, I'll just go through the here. See, North Korea won the Asian Games women's blah blah blah. In our summary, it's actually North Korea wins, which is an example of abstract summarization, because wins is not here at all. And the desired output is actually this. So it doesn't actually differ that much. And once you train it, it'll be a lot better. Um, here you can see another example of abstract summarization. Oil and gas pipelines across the Caspian Sea, Caspian oil pipelines. So it actually uses Caspian in a different way, um, but preserves the meaning of the sentence. So um, then we have to modify the architecture because, as I said, nobody's really doing controllable abstract summarization. So in, in order for the summarizer to be controllable, we need to modify it. And what we did is basically we inserted an extra layer in the neural network while maintaining compatibility with the pre-trained network. And this is uh, quite hard actually, because you've got the transform model architecture. What we needed to do is to modify this bit and this bit, so that even with the same inputs and outputs, it would check the length and of the output of the design output and be able to train the model accordingly. And the last bit is the, the training. So currently I'm still working on um, you know, just, just doing some passing of the data set and readying it for the final training, which will be done in the next week. And we're done on uh, 
Amazon Web Services. The public are allowed to print a large amount of data we have. But um, hopefully it will be done pretty soon. And I'm quite confident that it will res result in some pretty interesting um, results.
So the future direction of this project has at least two options. So first is to develop a novel design for the medical image uh, applications. So like the picture shown here, the existing or published errors uh, essentially use the simpler two-stage methods as ours instead of they're using some other segmentation network uh, such as the rest at here. And uh, so and this is a paper uh, published in the Nature Scientific Report this year. Uh, but is there a possibility to integrate these two parts in, into a more general framework? And moreover, uh, most of the image segmentation tasks mainly focus on the data encounter objects such as the cars or vehicles or pedestrians. But I think it's I believe it's quite different from such objects is quite different from the medical images. So maybe for the medical recognition tasks it might benefit from a more specialized or more unique design. And the second direction may be to try to incorporate the idea to, uh, of protecting user privacy into this uh, framework. So this kind of uh, requirements come from not only the user concerns, but also the mitigation of the legal risk from the enterprise. As we shown that simply anonymize the user's identification won't help. So instead, we are considering using a technique called differential privacy. So, but how to integrate the differential privacy into the current deep learning framework? We need to introduce the differential privacy in the stochastic gradient inside and the uh, framework called federative learning. Okay, so it is a quite hot topic, and there are quite a few workshops under this topic in the recent top machine conferences, such as the Games or JPA. And I will be joining your next this year since I got a program accepted by this conference. And hopefully there will be more insights into this project after the conference. So below are the formal mathematical uh, definition of the differential privacy. Uh, you can look up these references if you are interested. And uh, that's it. So if you are interested, please send your personal information to my mailbox. Okay, so now we are having one, sorry, two pizza presentations. So um, our first pizza presentation uh, is from Quantum Lab, a McKinsey company. So, so now you know why it's called pizza presentation. So Imran is actually the founder of um, Hackbridge and he's currently working in um, this company. So, hi Imran. Um, Where you'll be quite sure. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Um, so I won't chat too much because I know that uh, he has quite a few exciting announcements. Just want to say this is super awesome. Um, I think Cambridge is one of those universities that's yet to realise that you tend to learn the most when you actually do things as opposed to learn things in class. And it's really awesome to see people actually going out and actually building things because um, the reason why we started this in the first place was because I came back from MIT from the exchange program and noticed that everyone there was learning stuff because they were building things in their spare time. And you don't get that culture here. So if you take anything away from this, it's that um, just find a couple of friends uh, who are interested in the same sort of topics as you and then go ahead and try to build anything and Hackbridge is there to support you. And, and I think that like, that is the way in which you can like, really develop and really learn as an individual and start building cool things going out because there's no reason that should, um, there's no reason why you should be buried in an examples papers when you could be doing something far more interesting. Um, that aside, I'm here to plug Quantum Black, um, which is uh, the company I currently work for. Um, we are a data analytics slash AI house as part of uh, McKinsey and Company, which is a large management consulting firm. Sounds kind of dry, but what we do is actually apply a lot of the technologies that you see here to the real world. So some of our more exciting things are doing things like um, using reinforcement learning um, for race strategy in Formula One. Uh, so if you're interested in careers at QB, uh, do give me a call or a buzz or a text, whatever people use these days. And I'm happy uh, to speak a bit more about it.
Cool. Oh, yes. Uh, I didn't know these slides, okay. But yeah, so basically we worked on everything, uh, all the way from automotive to, to pharma and healthcare, and uh, we've got a bunch of really exciting projects. So do get in touch if you're interested. Thank you. Okay, hi. So I guess um, we are about to end soon, but before we end, uh, I'd like to introduce um, another of our partner, um, this Deep One New Global Business Plan Competition. So, um, this business plan competition actually has more than uh, 1 million Singapore dollars in prizes, no strings attached. So, if you're interested to um, know more about how to earn or win 1 million dollars, um, here it is. And the best part about it is that um, we have, for our Jumpstart Accelerator, at least one of our teams will get to their semi-finals. So you get a very huge head start by joining Jumpstart instead of just applying as a private candidate. And as a semi-finalist, you will get free accommodations and food in Singapore. And also, uh, if, I'm happy, if I happen to be there, uh, I'll make cocktails and cook for you. Yeah? <laughs>
Um, so the next one, um, sorry, the next Hackbridge cluster, the second Hackbridge cluster you know, is on the 4th of November, it's a Monday. Um, sorry for the um, confusion. Um, yeah. Okay, so another thing about the 21st um, regarding hack, the Hackbridge Jumpstart program. If you would like to start your own company, work on your own projects, or just to check out how it's like to uh, be an entrepreneur. So we actually have mentors to provide you with supervision style mentorship free for free uh, in entrepreneurship. So our mentors include um, our mentors include Judge Mrs. School, Entrepreneur First, Play um, Fair Capital, Syndicate Room, um, and just uh, two hours ago, um, I've, I've gotten a new we've gotten a new mentor on board. His name is Alexi. Um, he has started Counter.io. He's, uh, he just graduated from Cambridge three years ago, and within these three years, um, he had really built a series B company. Um, and in case you don't know what that means, it's probably worth about hundred million pounds or dollars. So he is the founder of that company, and he will be mentoring at least one of our teams. So it will be awesome if you could um, be part of our program and be accept, uh, and gain access to our pool of mentors. Oh yeah, so community applications. I think I spoke about that just now. Um, short survey. So the pre in the previous seven day we realized that our presentations are a bit too technical and so most people do not understand anything. So I'm just going to do a short survey right now. Um, these ways of having you can understand between 0 to 25% of the content. 25 to 50? Okay. 50 to 75? Um, almost everything. Um, sorry, keep your hands up if you think that it's too easy and uh, it's too boring. <laughs> okay. Um, and I think, may I survey, um, raise your hands if you think that it is too long. Okay, cool. So we can have longer than days in the future. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, another thing is that we have main text for networking. Um, and you'll find them where, um, somewhere in the back or in LR4. So that's where all the pizzas are. I think they're here already. Um, I can see my community members right now and all. So um, the main text would be industry partner, um, if you're an industry partner, um, and jumpstart research and commercial projects, um, consultancy. And so if you are interested in like more than one particles, you can just take more than one main text. And this would really help in networking because this would help other people to know um, what to speak to you about and also um, help you identify people. So please write your name on that main text. Last point, uh, sign up to our mailing list if you haven't. Um, we email very pretty badly or we try to. Okay, thank you for coming. Pizza time.